My name is Rashida Butler. I'm the president of VLS Balsa. Thank you guys for coming tonight and sharing your time with us. I know it's on a Friday night. You guys can be snuggly in your blankets, um, but thank you. Appreciate you all being here. So I wanna start off tonight by just um, recapping um, last week was race and the law bail reform, and also just give you a rundown of a list of our, of our events to come so you all can be aware of that. So race and the law was fr last Friday. It was bail reform. We have phenomenal speakers, and I appreciate all faculty, staff, professors, and students, and especially our Boston members for being a part of that. Thank you so much. And we had great conversations about bail reform in Vermont, particularly. And the AG, um, TJ Donovan, came out as our keynote speaker, and he was fabulous. Uh, moving forward, um, our next event will be next week. We have Valogram Bake Sale. So if you guys want to bake something, let us know. Uh, we love treats, and we want to um, just provide the VLS community with an opportunity to taste your good baking, baked goods. <laughs> um, after that, we do have Jazz Night. Jazz Night is a special night because I gave the task to our lovely one else, and two people stepped up and, and succeeded my expectations. Um, it's Gabby McMurdy. You know, stand up and say hi to people. Um, give her a round of applause. <laughs> also, it's um, Kyle Claus. He's not here tonight, I don't believe. Um, but also, they're working in tandem with professors and other students to get this event off the ground. Jazz night is February 17th. It would be from 6 to 9 p.m. 7 to 9 p.m. in this very room. Um, we're gonna have open mic, live music, and food. So please come out and support. And it's gonna be very, very, very great. And I'm looking forward to it. Um, not to forget, Tuesday next week, we have an uh, event with the Women's Law Group. And this event is very dear to my heart because we're talking about the intersectionality of Black Lives Matter and the Women's March and how we can come to the table and combine forces. Um, I'm not for sure if you all are aware of the tension between the two groups, but it is alive and well. And please come out. It's going to be at 12, 12.45 in Hoff Lounge. Um, Brown, bring your lunch. We will have, or we, we will have pizza if you don't eat pizza, but bring your lunch um, if you don't eat pizza. <laughs> um, and then following week, we have a great event with the PALSA. Um, this event is about colorism, and we will explore colorism in India and also in Africa and also in the, um, in the United States. We will show two documentaries. It's going to be a great event. That event will be February 21st, I believe, um, at 3.30 in Chase. So please come out and support that event as well. So what? So you guys are here because this event is called hashtag black girl magic. What's her magic? Like when I thought of this event, I thought of like, what can we do? Who can we bring here? And you will see we have fabulous speakers, panelists right here to my right. They're lovely, um, each and every one of them. So black girl magic is a term used to illustrate the universal awesomeness of a black woman, a woman of color all through the spectrum. It's about celebrating anything we deem particularly dope, inspiring, or mind-blowing about ourselves. And you may fit in that definition, and I hope you believe you fit in that definition because it's um, all-encompassing and it embodies who I am as a black woman and hopefully who you are. Black Girl Magic is a concept and movement that was like popularized by Kashawn Thompson in 2013. Black Girl Magic purpose is to congratulate black women on their accomplishments. And that's why we're here today. We're here to congratulate Justice Kahn of the Connecticut Supreme Court, Judge Cradle 
Supreme, the Superior Court in Connecticut, and also Rashana Gray. She is a historian at Harvard. These women embody what I strive to be as a black woman every single day, and hopefully who you strive to be. Um, and I like, just want to give a little background about myself. Like, I feel like I embody black girl magic in different ways. Um, just coming from the inner city of Chicago, I literally made a way out of no way. Like, I saw a goal, I obtained the goal, and I'm still kicking right now. And that's why I'm here at VLS, um, getting my JD, which is my fourth and last degree. And um, I am here to stay, and I'm here to make a change, and I'm here to make an impact and a lasting one at that. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, black girl magic means more than more than just accomplishments. Everything I do, or everything I did up to this point, everything I continue to do, I do it for a higher purpose. I do it for little girls that look like, look like me growing up, who see nothing more besides probably the opposite. I do it for those who think they can't do it, but they actually can. They just need somebody who looks like them who's doing it. For example, I am on the Vermont Journal of Environmental Law. I am proud of that journal. I love that journal. I had a goal when I came here last year to be on a journal or law review, either one, because that's what I wanted to do. I accomplished that goal. My next goal was to make the eBoard of VJL. Two weeks ago, we had elections. I am the new administrative editor of VGL. It is my wildest accomplishment while being here. And the reason why I say that is because I have a 14-year-old niece who looked up to me and who told me last week, she's like, Titi, I want to be like you. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be who you are. And this is why, that's what I think black girl magic means to me and how I embody it. And I will hope that you guys will take as much from this panel and this event that I will take. And I hope that you will love it just as much as I loved it from the time I thought about the concept until 9 p.m. tonight when it ends. <laughs> Um, no, um, so I would like to um, move forward and introduce one of our members. I would like to introduce um, Brentley Carter. He is a 2L senator here and a long-standing member of BALSA. Can you please give him a round of applause? Good evening, everybody. My name is Brantley Carter. I'm a 2L from Hartford, Connecticut, and um, it just feels good to be here. To Dean Jefferson, the honorees of the panel, thank you for coming. And um, tonight is actually a special night. Being the product of Black Girl Magic, my mom being a single parent, I feel blessed to, to be in the presence of other strong black women who embody that, and uh, I respect you all. At this time, I'm supposed to be introducing Professor Latham, but we are waiting on his arrival, so I don't really want to stall, but I don't know what to do. <laughs> so, um, I'm, I'm keeping it real. I, I cannot sing, but um, yeah. So, if you all... But to keep it rolling, if you all can just continue to chat and mingle, we'll be back in about. Why don't we roll with the panel and then we'll go back out? Yeah. Um, Latif, can you do me a favor and get Rashida, please? And thank you, Professor Barry. I guess we'll take it from there.
a joke? <laughs> knock, knock. Um, I don't have a joke, I guess, yet. I'm really sorry that you had to endure Brentley's horrible jokes. Um, but as you know, sometimes things happen. And in life, you have to roll with the punches. With that being said, um, I think that there's someone in this institution that does embody rolling with the punches. A person who has been here for a lot of the students of color and who has been a, a voice um, for us and everything that is happening. Um, it's actually really funny because as we're undergoing everything and trying to put things together, this person doesn't even know what we're presenting her with. So today we would like to honor a person that really, really embodies hashtag black girl magic, and that is Dean Jefferson. <laughs> so much. Um, yeah, it's been a rough two weeks for me. You know, I lost two good friends and a mentor. Um, thank you all so much. Um, but it's just so beautiful, you know, when people really appreciate your work. And I really just, I do it from my heart. I love this law school. I love you all, you know. It gave me a choice when no one else would. And some of you, we're doing the same. All you need is a chance. And you all have proven that you will take that chance and run away with it. We have great faculty here who will work with you, staff, uh, the community. Uh, and it's just, it's just beautiful. I just look over uh, the audience and Justice Khan and Judge Crado and my cousin here, we realize that we're cousins. <laughs> we're from Alabama. You know, and I, and, um, I just thank Balsa so. I'm really just caught off guard, because I really just, I, I had no idea. I was worried about Dean Latham. I was going to see if he was OK, you know. Uh, but I guess he's fine. I'm going to shut up. I'm going and, um, you know, sit down. I really appreciate all the things. Uh, that you all have done for me. It's you all that keep me going. It's, I'm proud of you all. I'm proud, I'm proud of each and every one of you because you didn't have to come here. You didn't. And once you arrived here, you didn't have to stay. But this is a place where we're trying to do our best. You know, some days we're a community and everybody feel happy, and some days we're not. But we're striving to be the best that we could be. And I just hope that you all continue to work with us and have patience and just, just love this country too. It will be the people that will change this country. Not the courts, not Congress, not the president, it's us. I believe in the power of people and I believe I believe in the power, just like Rashida. You know, I got a story to tell, too. You know? <laughs> coming from Selma, Alabama, and coming from a place where my mother died when I was 15 years old, with to take a week off to take care of my younger brothers and sisters. Seeing Bloody Sunday, uh, integrating my high school, I've seen this country at its most ugliest time. But I've also seen this country at its most beautiful time. And that's what I love. I love this country, too. 
no matter what people tell you, you can be and you can do anything that you want to do. There will be people along the way to help you. Never give up on your dream, never give up on hope, and never give up on yourselves. And thank you very much. So Professor Latham is here. I know you guys are like, it's a late night, but Professor Latham has some really powerful words to say about Dean Jefferson. So I would like to invite him to say those words. Professor Latham? I'm sorry I'm late, but I'm late for everything. Um, but uh, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm Mark Latham, um, and uh, also known as the King of Torts, uh, as well as the, the Queen of Soul in about a month or so, um, for reasons that I, I won't go into. But um, I, I'm also somehow on the faculty here, which is uh, remarkable. But um, Several weeks ago, Rashid and I were talking, and she um, mentioned to me all the events that Balsa is hosting. I had ran, ran from party lot, but um, hosting for Black History Month, and it's really amazing all the things that, that Balsa has done. And so, um, first of all, let's give them a hand for that. <laughs> but, but. Um, We also decided that it would be a, a really great time to recognize, once again, Dean Jefferson for all that she has done for this um, school. Now, um, and, and Black History Month is, of course, a time when uh, we recognize and reflect on the trials and tribulations of African Americans in this great country um, we call the United States of America, which, of course, is not a perfect country. Uh, it's flawed. And sort of the way that African Americans have been treated in the United States has been um, uh, terrible and awful. But, but Black History Month is, is not just about the horrors of slavery and the indignations of Jim Crow. It's also about the accomplishments of African Americans, not only in the United States, but ar around the world. And so that's why we're here today to celebrate that uh, and recognize that. Now, when I think of Dean Jefferson, um, and what I would say tonight, one of the things that, that I thought about was a um, rather humbling conversation I had with my mother, who Dean Jefferson knows, um, decades ago. Uh, now that I'm six, I can say that, decades ago. Um, I'm getting old. But um, she asked me one fall, who, I, who, who was I going to vote for? I think it was a Carter Reagan election, perhaps. But anyway, I, I told her, I said, well, Mom, I don't like either of them. I'm going to sit this one out. And she's reading a book, and she uh, quietly put it down and said, um, Mark, don't you know that people died so that you could vote? And of course, my mother was right. And uh, since then, I have not missed a single election, whether it's for the President of the United States or for uh, the Hartford dog catcher. Uh, I, I vote. Um, now. Um, the, the reason Shirley Jefferson reminds me of that is because um, about uh, 50, more than 50 years ago, uh, I believe it was March of 1965, uh, there were uh, hundreds of people gathered in um, uh, outside the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and uh, this was primarily black folks who wanted the right to vote. That's what the Constitution guaranteed us. That's what the courts had said, and that's what they wanted. And that's all they wanted. And so as they started to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge, uh, Alabama state troopers and others uh, br brutally attacked the marchers, hiding behind their uh, badges. And, um, but, but that didn't stop them, and it didn't stop Dean Jefferson. She marched across that bridge, 
and she also um, marched across the stage at VLS decades later with a JD in hand and went on to pass the bar and practice law in Washington, D.C. Uh, and, and I first met this remarkable woman uh, in December of 2004 when I came here to interview for a faculty position. And I, I, I didn't know Shirley Jefferson then, uh, but as soon as she walked in the room, I knew that uh, this was a powerful person. Uh, and, and we didn't talk for very long because she had a meeting to go to. But after I spoke with her, I, I realized that, yes, she, she was indeed a force. And uh, she is a powerful force. She is a force for good, a force for what is right, a force for what is ethical, moral, and just, and a force for that which must be done, no matter how difficult or challenging it may be. Um, and um, when I was a dean, uh, I learned a lot from Shirley Jefferson. But the one thing that I learned from the first day I walked in this uh, campus was that we're very fortunate to have her here. She was indeed the heart and soul of Vermont Law School. And thank you so much, Shirley, for all that you have done for this school, all that you've done for me, and all that you've done for the students. Uh, so, so, so thank you. And thank you for letting me say a few words about my dear friend. Uh, we all really do owe a debt of gratitude to uh, Shirley Jefferson. So, so thank you. Without further delay, I would like to introduce our two moderators for t um, today's event. We have a 1L, Latif Munir. He is a great, amazing, fabulous, funny person. I appreciate having him in BASA. Next to him, we have Ray Carr, or, um, Reynold Carr, Carre? Carre, so sorry. Um, he's also a 1L. He has been the feet on the ground for this Black History Month. He is the reason why all these flyers are hanging around our school, why our programs are being made, and he has done a lot uh, for BASA. So I want to introduce them. They will be asking these lovely ladies questions. Take it away, fellas. Well, uh, I'd like to begin this panel discussion by uh, introducing our panelists. Uh, I'd like to first begin with uh, Rashana Gray. Uh, she coordinates the Harvard Business School's Gender Initiative and researches at Tufts University's History Department and Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. She spent two years serving on Mass Now's Legislative Task Force supporting Massachusetts pay equity, anti-shackling, healthy youth, and trans equal access and public accommodations bills. After years of serving as her family's historian, she's currently writing Roseland, a book about the last 200 years of her family's history through the lives of her uh, matrilineal ancestors. And this is especially special for me because uh, we share a home, Boston. And then moving on to the Honorable Melanie Judd, uh, the Honorable Judge Melanie Cradle. Uh, she presides over the New Haven District Superior Court in Connecticut. And for 13 years prior, she was the uh, state's attorney. Um, she's also the VP of the Connecticut Judges Association and is on the rule committee. She was appointed in 2013 by Governor Dan Malloy. And she comes to the bench from Middlefield, Connecticut, the town that abuts mine. I uh, Middletown, Connecticut. Judge Cradle. Originally from Angola, Africa, Justice Maria Orojo Khan moved to the U.S. at the age of 10 years old. She earned her bachelor's degree from NYU Law with cum laude honors, and later earned her JD from Fordham University. Before becoming a judge, Justice Khan served as an assistant U.S attorney in New Haven, Connecticut. Justice Khan currently sits as a co-chair of the J Judicial Branch's Access to Justice Commission and the Limited English Proficiency Committee. She also serves as a member of the Justice Education Committee and has taught several courses at the Connecticut Justice Institute. Additionally, Justice Khan is a James W. Cooper Fellow with the Connecticut Bar Foundation. And with that, I introduce to you guys Justice Khan. So, I'll 
first question begins with, uh, what does Black Girl Magic's movement mean to you? And what makes Black women magical to you? Sure, I suppose I will start. Hey, y'all. Um, oh, yes, call and response. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, I grew up Kojic. Don't make me shout. Oh, I will, I will put the water down. Um, so I always, I always relish in the opportunity to, um, to celebrate uh, black women. Um, I think it's especially important that we are celebrated and celebrate one another beyond our utility. Um, and so it's not just about um, this movement from where I'm sitting isn't just about what we can do for ourselves, for other people, what we can do despite this ism or this phobia. It's, um, it's just wonderful to see so many black women, um, both in real life and on social media. Uh, I live on social media. Um, it's just wonderful to see other black women say, this is who I am. I take up space, not because I deserve it or because I've earned it, but because simply by virtue of being a human being, um, I have a right to be here. Um, it always makes me really happy. Um, and the, the latter part of the question, what makes black women magical to me? So I'm writing this book about the last two centuries of my family's history. And it'll be about six matrilineal ancestors and me, and we'll each have our own chapter, uh, each written out of the year we turned 31. So for me, that's last year. But for that first ancestor, Martha, born enslaved in Virginia in 1820, I'm writing about 1851, one year into the Fugitive Slave Act. Like I'm writing about the women who lived lives um, in ways that left room for my existence. Um, and that magic, that sort of matrilineal conjure woman blues magic makes me really happy to be alive. And I celebrate it when I witness it in people that I just meet and we have sweet language between us, that fictive kinship that sort of sits beyond words. It just makes me really happy. Well, in terms of what the black girl magic movement means to you, I think it's, I have two very young daughters and I think it's really important uh, for them to be able to have uh, examples of, you know, um, powerful women uh, that, you know, and a movement where you have black women that are sticking together, that are supportive of one another. Uh, I think it's important for, especially for my young children, to be able to see that black women come in many shades, shapes, uh, and uh, and can be uh, and are so extremely successful, especially uh, because my children pretty much grow up in the, in an area where it is not very diverse. So I think that's very important. Uh, for, especially for my kids. Um, what makes black women magical to me? Um, I come from a family, I have a pretty diverse family. I have, my mother is a German and uh, my father is black. So I have very strong uh, black women uh, on my father's side of the family that were educators and uh, they were wonderful role models uh, for me, and I look very much up to them, and they have shared their experiences, uh, you know, growing up in this country and their struggles. So I think it's that's uh, they've provided, you know, excellent role models to me, and uh, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for them, and uh, I hope that some of their strength and their uh, their strong ca uh, characteristics I've also uh, developed as well. I, I would echo what both panelists have said, and I would say, as for me, the movement, I think it's really important to have role models. I certainly had role models in my life when I came here. My um, first teacher in a bilingual class was a black woman. Um, and so, to me, uh, maybe this is a generational gap. We didn't have a movement but we had a de facto movement. You had to make your own movement. Um, so I think it's really important uh, for young uh, women of color, all women, to have a movement like this because it's important for black women to be out there and to be visible and to show uh, that 
younger uh, women, uh, both women of color and not, that they can su succeed. Um, so I think it's really important. As far as what makes uh, black women magical to me, I'm just inspired um, and it makes me want to be better, uh, a better lawyer, a better judge, a better person when I get to work with folks like Judge Cradle, uh, who's a dear friend of mine, uh, and other women in my life of color who have uh, inspired me. Uh, and so, and I think of uh, not just women who are professional, but I think all of us here, I would venture to say, stand on the shoulders of women who uh, struggled like Dean Jefferson. Uh, these are the women that have paved the way for us and we owe them a debt of gratitude. So when I think of the magical black women uh, being magical to me, I think of folks like Dean Jefferson because if it weren't for them, uh, we wouldn't be here, so. Thank you all. From your perspective, how can movements like Black Girl Magic uplift black women? This one's a toughie for me um, because I, I feel jazzed that the movement exists in the first place. Now, because I pay my rent by researching history, I will usually tell people, oh, oh, we, we have to make sure that the young folks know their history. Of course, we have to follow all the elders around and collect their stories and make sure that our younger cousins are bored with us during Thanksgiving and Christmas and all that stuff. Um, but I think that movements like Black Girl Magic uh, would do well to, um, how do I say this? Um, as we affirm one another, remind each other that we, how do I say this? that we don't do ourselves any favors by replicating the systems that we already live in. Um, in my little sliver of the Black Girl Magic movement, I've been fortunate to have these very intentional, meaningful heart-to-hearts um, with black women that I don't share um, other facets of identities, you know, of identity with. Oh, thank you. Um, and so, for example, I'm a black woman, but I'm also cisgendered and able-bodied and documented, a native Anglophone. You know, I don't go to church that often anymore, don't tell my mama. But I was raised, <laughs> I was raised in a Christian family in an Islamophobic society. Um, and so I, while I value the movement, I think we also have um, a responsibility to the weight of history and the truth. You know, we're all cultural beneficiaries and, you know, agents and ancestors. We, you know, we were born into a world socialized according to our little bundle of identities. We're, you know, we're affected by it every day. We affect change in our circles. And eventually, we'll each play a role in passing down society, regardless of whether or not we have kids. And I think it's so important that we re remind one another in love um, that we're compelled to a higher standard of what it means to be human. Um, and that's going to require uh, conviction. And it's going to require intense conversations that will hopefully lead to a whole lot more magic. Um, that's what I got. I think for me, I think um, that, you know, we all stand on the shoulders of other people also. And I think it, you know, it reminds us to be the best that we can be. But I also hope that just by virtue of this movement also, it makes us aware uh, that we have to stick together and help each other out and also help encourage uh, those of us who may not be in the position that we are to help support them um, and, and again, pay it forward, you know? So if there is, let's say, you know, you are, you have a job for me, for me in my position, I try to mentor uh, as many, as, as many people that I can, uh, try to encourage them to, um, you know, if, if, they're, if they're looking perhaps maybe to become a judge, to help them to uh, apply for positions in the bench, on the bench, to help uh, get internships, uh, internship positions uh, for other people, uh, and you know, I think it's it's just we have to be mindful that we don't want to you know kind of cut each other down. It should be we should be supportive of one another. There's always strengths in in numbers, 
and uh, we help each other rise. I would add to what uh, both panelists have said as far as, um, from my perspective, how movements like this can help. I think that when you are able to, to speak with someone who has a shared life experience, there's an, almost an instant connection and understanding. You almost don't have to speak the words because you have experienced life through that lens, through that uh, experience. And so I think movements like this, to the extent that they can identify and facilitate interaction with, between women of color um, and can bring uh, someone together to share those experiences, it's, it's pretty powerful. So for example, I'm a cancer survivor. And when I meet another cancer survivor, there's an understanding of what we went through, of what that feeling is like. And so I think that's the same for minorities and women of color. Obviously, it's no surprise when I was a federal prosecutor, I was telling someone today, I was the one of two minorities, Keith King, who is now a, a reverend, um, and we ate lunch together every day and because we understood each other and the challenges that, that we face. Um, and so I think movements like this um, not only hopefully inspire others, but also give us a certain comfort level, a certain sense of we're not alone out there um, to face challenges. Thank you all. And this question will start with you, Justice Khan. Uh, do you feel this movement has changed the way society perceives black women? Hmm. That's a tough question. You started the tough question with me. Um, I, I don't have an answer to that question, and here's why. I hope, I would like to think, and I hope that movements like this change perceptions and change people you know, open their minds. As you know, I teach implicit bias and cultural competency. And the thing I say to folks is we all have implicit biases. I do. I catch myself doing it all the time. So even if a movement like this can change one person's mind or open one person's mind, then I think it's worth it. And I'll share an example with you of why I think it's important. Within the first two weeks of being on the Supreme Court, I had a case, a lawyer in front of us arguing a case over contract dispute, and I won't say much more because it could disclose it, but it's public record, right, because they're recorded. And this lawyer gets up and he's talking about his contract, the contract in dispute. And Justice Robinson, who I teach implicit bias with, asked him a question about the contract terms and whether his clients understood them. To which he said, well, my sophisticated business clients understood it. I don't mean to speak ill of my clients, but I do have some clients, you know, that, well, they're immigrants, you know. I mean, immigrants do what they can do. They don't go to law school. so." they don't understand the contract. What do Im uh, immigrants, you know, they do what they can do. They don't go to law school, they sell gas. I, I don't mean any offense, that's just how it is. To which Justice Robinson went like this, looked at me, and I slipped my colleague a note saying, could someone please tell this man that I'm an immigrant and I'm not selling gas? Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the point, I guess I'm trying to make is I think to the extent that movements like Black Girl Magic can open people's eyes to successful black women, uh, even if it's one or two people whose stereotypes or impressions or implicit biases we change, uh, then I think it's important. I think it's also important for the black community. 
because studies tell us that minorities will also have implicit biases against their own ethnic or minority groups. So to the extent that women can pull each other up, I think it may change also women of color's perception of themselves and implicit biases of themselves. So. I, I, I honestly don't have anything to add to that because I thought that was a hard question too and I wasn't really uh, sure how to answer that because I don't, I don't know if this movement has changed the way society perceives black women, but I, I certainly hope uh, it does. And I, I would just have to say, how can it not? You know, because again, you're creating awareness, so. Um, so my response is, is two-pronged. Internally, I love that, um, I love how this movement has given me new language for hope. Um, I am, I have a very distinct personality. You know, I, I meet folks for the first time and I ask a bunch of questions. I'm always trying to get at the roots of things. So, you know, oh, your last name's beautiful. Where's your family from? I, I think I did that with you. Um, and so when I, you know, when I'm in one neighborhood of, of, you know, the black girl magic conversation online, I am marveling at, you know, all of the selfie taken black girls who are magical and doing their thing in the art world and whatever given industry, um, you know, and I'm, you know, sitting from my little corner of academia, uh, cheering them on. It, it, it restores my soul in a very real way. Um, and, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't realize how much I needed that. Um, Y'all, I might have said this before, but I pay my bills by researching the underside of United States history. Um, I am constantly researching, you know, the roots of domestic terror. Um, I am, you know, through this book that I'm writing about my family, I'm tracking the places where we lived and I'm, you know, cultivating language for how vulnerable they were, you know, throughout time in certain, uh, in certain parts of the country. Um, and so it, it restores my soul in a very real way to see other black women flourishing and being magical um, in whatever field or industry that might be. Now, externally, not, you know, my opinions on what non-black girls might think about black girl magic. I'm gonna try to say this without cursing. I really don't care. <laughs> um, and, and I'll tell you why, and I'm gonna try my best not to butcher this. But one of my favorite uh, things to tell folks about is the theory of the crooked room. I think I might have read about it in um, Melissa Harris Perry's uh, book, Sister Citizen. And she writes about this experiment where um, a participant is invited to come into a room and you know the, the floors and the ceiling and the walls are all painted black and there are um, there are warped images all throughout the room. There's a chair in the middle, the person is encouraged, the participant sits down in the chair, lights are turned off for a series of moments and, um, and the chair uh, is tipped you know up to, I don't know, say 45 degrees. And so it turns out that it's all about you know perception and it turns out that so many of the participants could be tipped as much as 45 some degrees and would swear up and down that they were upright. Um, and, and so I'm gonna encourage you to read the book because I totally butchered that, but here is why I shared that nugget with you. Um, I am always very careful um, about which uh, images I use to ground myself as I navigate the crooked rooms of the world. And it is very easy to step into a room, in a dark room with a warped floor and a warped ceiling and crooked images all around you. It's very easy um, to start to think that you're sitting straight up and down. Um, it's, it becomes so easy. We, I, and I'll personalize this. During certain moments in my life, it became incredibly easy for me to align myself with a warped image. And I'm getting, I'm starting to get choked up which is why I already got my tissue handy. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll wrap this up so I'm not monopolizing this panel, but at the end of the day, I try my very best not to be concerned. When it comes to discussing and marveling in black girl magic, I'm, I try my best to not be very concerned about what outsiders might think or the effect that my image might have in you know, the, the, another person's ability to see me as fully human. Um, because it's too expensive a priority um, and it doesn't restore me the way that that internal conversation would. Um, so yeah, that's my very rambly, a little bit long-winded question or response. Uh, 
I'd like to start this next question with uh, Justice Cradle. Do you feel that you have to go above and beyond to defy stereotypes about black women? Um, I, don't, I don't think I have to go above and beyond. I think that to defy stereotypes, I think that I, you know, especially when it comes to work, I make sure always that I'm prepared. I make sure that I am on time. I make sure, you know, I am honest. Uh, and uh, w what I say, I mean, I do what needs to be done. Um, and that being said, I hold myself as a professional. I'm always mindful that, you know, things uh, for us don't come as easy as it does for other people, especially I, f I find sometimes in the legal profession um, where, you know, networking is really essential. Sometimes uh, it's harder uh, to make the connections that you need to make. Other people have them. You may not. And therefore, you know, I think that you, kind, you do have to work harder. Um, you have you have to you have to work harder, and you have to make sure um, that you're basically on top of your game all the time. Um, and I think that that is uh, it's really important. Um, but in terms of do I go out of my way to defy stereotypes? I don't think uh, I do that purposefully. I just it, it is who I who I am and what I try to do. So I always try to you know make sure that I am always professional. Oh, we can go uh, left to right, so, yes. Um, so, oh gosh, another multifaceted answer. Um, and so I would love to piggyback. Um, so I, I was just telling my best friend as I was driving up here, I mean, I was using a headset, so don't worry, I wasn't using my hands to hold <laughs> out. You know, I have to lay the groundwork, context. Um, and so I was just telling her, you know, how you know, I'm, I'm, I was born and raised in Chicago. I'm 900 miles from home, an only child. Um, my, my poor mama. Um, we talk very often. Um, but I, I was telling my best friend that I often feel like I'm walking on a tightrope, you know, and, and that I'm uh, trying to delicately balance every facet of my life. And it's, it's a lot of work. I am a millennial. I have 97 jobs um, because I have all the bills and all the student loans because I came out of college in 2008. <laughs> with three quarters of a philosophy degree. <laughs> a moment of silence for my wallet and credit score. <laughs> um, but I, and so I often feel, um, um, I, don't, I don't set out to defy stereotypes, but I do often feel like, um, I feel this, this pressure, you know. Um, I, I wanna s remain intentional and humble, so you know, um, I, I want to earn everything that I have. You know, I want to make sure that I'm uh, participating to the best of my ability. I want to make sure that when I'm in conversation or community with other people, I want to make sure that my contribution is, uh, is, is meaningful and worth it. I, I feel this constant pressure to be on and intentional. Um, and so that's one facet of it. I also feel like, um, I feel like, Kindness and empathy are things that I um, owe other people. Um, and whenever I talk about stereotypes, I, I like to emphasize those two things because we rob one another of our dignity when we deal in stereotypes. And I know that this, you know, we're all stewing in the same vat. This, this country has done a number on me too. I've been socialized um, uh, in ways that are connected to a number of systems of oppression and I have a lot to unlearn. I'm constantly thinking about um, how I've been socialized to not see people, to not empathize with people. Um, you know, I, when I moved to Massachusetts, <laughs> it was after four years of college, I moved uh, down there with $12 in my purse, um, and I had, you know, arranged for a job that provided room and board, and so don't worry, I was safe. Um, but I, I set out to continue my education. So I said, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna move to what's considered the academic capital of the world, the country, and I'm gonna attend lectures, I'm gonna interview scholars, and I'm gonna make a point to only interview the living scholars who, you know, whose scholarship scared the mess out of me or shook up my worldview. 
you know, because my wonderful hometown Chicago is diverse, but it's hyper segregated. You know, I had a very specific experience in Chicago, which, you know, its former nickname used to be Northern Mississippi. My, my worldview was so severely limited. And it wasn't until I got grown that I realized that the way I had been raised and socialized rendered me less able to be in community with people that weren't like me. And over time, I had to learn, or I had to come to terms with the fact that I was robbing people of their dignity when I wasn't dealing with them as if they were full human beings that had a story to share with me. Um, and so I make a point to uh, uh, you know, constantly check in with myself and do these little mind flips. Um, and so I'm not gonna get up here and preach at you all, but one of the tenets of, of what I was taught when I was growing up in church was, you know, sin is anything that separates us from the love of God. And when I got grown, I was like, okay, well, what if sin is anything that, you know, creates or maintains an unhealthy chasm between me and another person? And if as a straight person that's homophobia or queerphobia, I have something to work on. You know, if as a cisgendered person, having been socialized in a transphobic society, if that makes me less able to hold space for you for in your full humanity, then that, that's indicative of a character flaw or, or a hardened heart on my part, and that means that I have more work to do. And so on the flip side of that, I also feel like empathy, kindness, intention, those are things that other folks owe me too. And so while I don't you know, live my life uh, in hopes of defying other people's stereotypes, I think that when I personally aim for a higher standard of what it means to be human, I wind up landing among you know, uh, the opportunities to defy stereotypes, because it, it raises the bar for the other person too. Um, then that's what I got. So I, I think that um, defying stereotypes, I agree with Judge Cradle, that you do that by living your life and by setting the example of who you are. The reality is, if you're a woman and if you're a minority woman, um, it is gonna be harder. You do have to work extra hard. And I'm gonna just put a plug in for Judge Cradle. She's an amazing presiding judge in New Haven, has one of the hardest court uh, jurisdictions to manage um, and has done that amazingly well. And so she stands as a role model and every day by what she does defies the stereotype. Now, for me, it's different because look at me. If people don't know my maiden name and they don't know much about me and they just look at how I look, they'll say all kinds of stuff like, well, immigrants sell gas because that's all they can do. I proceeded to ask the lawyer, so I just want to understand your argument. Your clients, sophisticated clients, they'll understand this contract, but what did you say your immigrant clients, they're too dumb to understand it? Precisely, he said to me. Um, and so my colleagues you know, knew I was toying with them, uh, but the, the point I guess I'm making is I don't think I go out of my way to defy stereotypes but I can tell you that when I'm with my parents and they don't speak English and we're speaking Portuguese, people react to me differently. And so those are the situations where I feel like I have to defy stereotypes um, more often than not. And teaching microaggressions that can wear you down, right? It's those subtle messages. They're not saying it, but you know they're thinking it. Um, and so in teaching, we teach that there are different coping mechanisms. I'm, you know, sometimes I use humor. Sometimes I joke. Sometimes I sort of toy with people and make them, you know, articulate what they're thinking. Um, and I really hope that lawyer goes and looks at our bios. Um, and uh, I think opposing counsel knew because they kept looking very uncomfortable. Um, so I, I guess I think the best way to defy stereotypes because we te I teach it and I think that 
when we teach that subject, people don't like to talk about race and implicit bias. It's uncomfortable. And so it, we have to be very careful when we teach it. We try to teach it in a way that engages everyone because we all do it. And so the, the thing I think that's most effective is empathy and it's understanding, but it's also finding the way to open someone's mind without before they shut down. So we try to teach it in a way that's not preaching to someone, but that makes people understand that we're all different and that we will live in a better world and it's in all of our interests to understand each other and to check our implicit biases, check our stereotypes and be aware of them. And that's for me personally and for everyone else when I teach that subject. Um, while you still have the mic in your hand, I'd like to remain on you, Justice Khan. <laughs> what, are some of, what are some of the challenges you face as a woman of color and how have you overcome some of these challenges? Um, you know, I think that the, I think my challenges are probably similar to other uh, women, certainly. Um, I, I think, as I mentioned before, I think sometimes not, I cannot walk. I have many friends, women of color, and it's different for them because you can look at them and know they're a woman of color. Uh, people may not uh, know that about me. You know, um, it's when we teach implicit bias, we have the pyramid, right? We make assumptions about how somebody looks, but we're only looking at the, the top of the iceberg. We, we don't see all about that person. Um, so some of the challenges, I, I had financial challenges. I lived at the Salvation Army Residence Hall for women. Um, they don't go away. And so I use the example of oral argument. And I'm joking about it. But obviously it affected me, right, at a certain level. When we went into conference, I said to my colleagues, I'm not sure I could vote on this case. After all, I'm just a dumb immigrant. Um, but it's those kinds of subtle, I think for me, it's more seeing those kinds of subtle messages and how they can eat away at your confidence. And so I think the challenges are to uh, try to set, not let those kinds of things bring you down and not let your self-worth be based on how somebody else perceives you. Because you can't control how somebody else is going to react, but you can control you and what you do. Um, and so I've been fortunate that I had good role models and great supports. I didn't do it all on my own but that constantly fed that, that self-confidence in, in me. I think when I first started in the legal profession, it was really difficult for me to find support. I came from my family, uh, I did not come from a family of lawyers. In fact, I didn't know uh, really any lawyers in the state of Connecticut. I attended law school in New Jersey, so much of my networking had been done in New Jersey. and then. I decided to come back or go back home to Connecticut for law school. So when I first started out, there was um, the, there's the George Crawford Law uh, Association, which is like the Black Law Association in Connecticut that I joined. Um, there are not a lot, many, that many uh, lawyers of color in Connecticut. And when I first started out in my career, I uh, was a prosecutor. So in the area of criminal law, not only uh, were there not a lot of black lawyers, there were hardly any black uh, females. And uh, you know, in the beginning, I found it to be quite a challenge because I felt a little bit like I was alone. Uh, I felt like uh, I, you know, no one was reaching out to me necessarily for guidance, even in my own office, because in Connecticut it was it's kind of like a, or at least was, you know, uh, and to a certain extent still is, you know, like a old boys club. And, you know, I, I struggled with that uh, for a little bit just because I felt like, you know, I, you know, if I needed help or if I wanted uh, guidance on cases sometimes, you know, I really had to reach out to get it. 
Um, and I think from that experience, that's really where I learned, you know, also how important networking was uh, and how important it is now. And that's why when I was talking, you know, earlier about reaching out to people who are starting out, it is just so important because it is hard. It's very difficult, especially when you're starting out to find, to get that support and, and find the support you need. And, you know, and it's important to, to make sure, especially for young lawyers, that they feel supported. And then once you get to a certain point, you gotta, you know, reach out and, and support those uh, after you. Um, so networking is, is, is really essential, I think, and not just amongst black lawyers, but amongst everybody, because you need, to, you, you need the support of, of people also to get ahead. Um, let's see, I'm trying to determine how vulnerable I want to be. Um, so let's just go full out. Um, we're all cousins. Um, I, so let's see, I was in college from 2004 to 2008. Um, and in the spring of 2008, I was thinking, okay, you know, I'm going to continue my hop around the country, you know, because during undergrad, back in my day, um, every summer I'd pull out a map of the states, pick a random city and find a short term job that provided room and board. That's how I wound up in Massachusetts because I had had a few stops before. And so the summer of 06 was spent in San Francisco, 07 was LA, 08 was Boston the first time. I go back home to Chicago in hopes of finishing college. And there is no money to do so. Um, and there is no co-signer to help me get another loan. Um, and I am not tall and I can't play football and I can't do any of the things to get sports scholarships. Um, and so I was just out of luck. And so I went to spend the next year living in a northern Illinois suburb with a family member. Um, and this family member had a series of issues of their own, um, really struggled with trauma and mental health issues. And so it was the two of us. Um, and there were so many low points. Um, I was 22 and I thought, you know, my goodness, I'm trying to survive on $35 a week. You know, um, here I am um, on the, you know, with the front row seat to someone else's, um, how do I say this? To someone else's trauma, watching them flail, trying to provide whatever emotional support that I could. Um, and it was an incredibly difficult year. And I remembered thinking, oh my goodness, I'm only 22. I don't want my life to be over you know, before I really start living, what am I gonna do about this situation that I'm in? And so I eventually, you know, I interview remotely for different positions. I land one in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I make my little way to the airport and I set out to do this, you know, uh, lecture hopping, you know, in addition to uh, working this job in Central Square in Cambridge. Um, I also, and so I would basically hop around New England, attending lectures and conferences and you know, either creating content or doing social media. And then I was like, okay, well now that I've got academia, you know, now that I've got that track going, I'm gonna have a house of worship hop so I can learn more about the faith traditions that are outside my own. And so I got to, um, uh, I Googled a bunch of different houses of worship. I would talk to you know, whoever picked up the phone. Uh, I would get some, you know, some insight into their communities. I would ask if I could attend a lecture and then I would stay afterward and ask a few questions about the cultural tradition and the history. Um, and I realized over time that I have both, um, I, I have an affinity for and I'm very skilled at holding space for other people, um, listening to stories, um, weighing them, you know, wrapping language around them and then spreading the, spreading the word to other people. Um, and New England did a number on me. You all, you know, I thought, oh, okay, you know, I grew up, you know, as a little kid and adolescent, everybody told me I was so, so smart and I couldn't cut it and I didn't finish college. You know, who am I? What is my value? What is my worth if I don't have a degree? You know, here I am, um, uh, how do I say this? At the time I was underemployed. So even though, you know, I had a place to live, I wasn't making any money. Again, remember, millennial, still saddled with debt, came out of college in 08. And for the first time in my life, you know, I'm this college dropout sitting in the front rows at these, you know, lectures at Ivy League institutions and everyone has their advanced degrees and their bow ties. Um, and people are introducing themselves and mentioning that they're Mayflower descendants in literally the first three or four minutes. And it blew my mind. Um, 
and that was the first time that I really thought about my own ancestry. Like, you know, who am I? Where do I come from? Where do I fit into all of this? You know, what does my blackness mean if it doesn't have a bow tie on it and two master's degrees? Um, how do I provide value? And why for so long has that been the rubric I've been using um, as I've been meeting people? And over time, I realized that if I just relax and lean into the way that I'm naturally inclined to go out and meet people, learn from them in community, have them pour into me and then spread that word. Whenever I sought out um, the experiences and engineered those connections with other people, I got lessons that strengthened my character, um, cracked open my worldview, convicted me, it made me a better person, a more intentional human being. And that's when the opportunities opened up. Um, and so one of, one of my 94 jobs is over at Tufts University. Um, like folks mentioned, I research in the history department and the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. And I assist um, Professor Kendra Field over at Tufts. And um, her book just came out about, you know, the first generation of her family after, after freedom came and how they went west into Oklahoma. And, you know, amazing story. The book's called Growing Up With The Country. Amazing woman. You should, you should read her stuff. But it turns out that um, our families were in the same Mississippi Delta town after freedom came. And we didn't meet each other until I was working a temp job at Tufts in Medford. All of a sudden, I was, you know, um, so broke. I mean, had to save up for ramen noodles broke. Um, and I was chronicling these class, um, uh, this, this course catalog for Tufts, and all of a sudden I see her name next to David Blight, um, a person that I had marveled at when I visited Yale. And so I Google her, email her, ask her if I can talk. All of a sudden, this conversation blossomed into this really wonderful opportunity to assist her. I was in a unique position to, um, to lend a hand through research Oddly enough, because of a connection that our ancestors had a century and a half before. And it, it was only as a result of me trusting my journey, being brave, courageous, curious, and willing to be uncomfortable long enough to learn those lessons that I was able to have the opportunity. I, um, and so, yeah, when I, think about, um, when I think about what I've had to overcome in order to get here, I often feel embarrassed um, because a few of these circumstances were beyond my control. But, I, am, I'm, I can honestly say that I'm glad for my experiences. Um, and it was only through humility, dedication, and so many people who poured into me that I'm here now. I'd actually like to stay with you to finish off our last question. And I'll be brief, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go ahead. Um, what inspires you? And how do you use that inspiration to inspire others? And uh, for this last one, go left to right. What inspires me? I think uh, over the years I've become very practiced at finding inspiration in just about everything. And y'all, I mean everything from, um, how do I say this? The folks who are busking in front of Berkeley, um, you know, the, uh, the people that I have random heart to hearts with at bus stops. I'm telling you, it pays to be Midwestern with Southern roots in New England, because just about anybody will talk to you. And also, I think I have a face for it. I don't know, I think people sense, oh, she has a fluffy spirit. I think that I will tell her my whole life story at this bus stop. <laughs> and sometimes I benefit from that too. Um, and so it's, yeah, I think that's my short answer. I've, I've been very fortunate to have so many opportunities to, um, uh, to cultivate inspiration. And even, in, if, even if something is on the surface mundane, I'm very good at making meaning. Um, from interactions. Um, and so, let's see, how do I try to inspire others? I think that simply by me staying in my lane and doing what I'm good at, I think that that resonates with people. I have a very, I'm, I'm usually very honest about my journey. Um, and I think that my sincerity and investment really comes across. At least that's the feedback that I normally get from, from folks that I interact with. Um, I have, I, I'm very fortunate to be able to say that I get up in the morning and I do what I feel called to do. When I tell you all after, um, after a really long time of feeling like I didn't have a place, like I had squandered my opportunities, like, you know, you know I'm, I'm a grandchild of the Great Migration. You know, I'm part of that generation. I'm why my ancestors left Mississippi. How can I not finish college? How can I not make good on that, um, on, you know, 
how, how can I not embody the hope that they had? How could I fail? How could I drop the ball? Um, but I can honestly say, despite my meandering, maybe as a result of my meandering, um, I've been fortunate to, to be exactly where I needed to be at exactly the right time. And I think that's what resonates with other people. Um, she inspires me. I mean, she, <laughs> she, she's amazing in so many ways, professionally, personally. And the way, the kindness, you know, that she, she's just a she's just a kind, wonderful person, and she cares about people. And I'm sure you can already tell that. So she inspires me. But probably what really inspires me most of all is young people, especially my kids. I want my children to be proud of their mother. And I sit in criminal court, so I see people at their the lowest of lows. And, you know, because of that, because I see a lot of the bad in the world sometimes, and I'm not just talking about the people, just the situations uh, that people are in and, and can't get out of. Um, you know, I think providing hope to people uh, is what I try to do sometimes when I'm on the bench and also trying to do the right things for the right reasons. Um, I try to do a lot of work with kids and talking to uh, students, uh, more specifically in the New Haven area that, where I sit, but you know, any opportunities I have to share with them you know, my experiences, not just personally, but also in court, uh, just to hope, you know, in hopes that they don't uh, go down the same path, and also just to provide them with hope that you, know, you can be obviously anything that you wanna be. Um, so that, you know, really by speaking, you know, in, in the community and doing community work and also with kindness, that's how I try to inspire others. So, you know, it's, there's a mutual uh, admiration here. Uh, I uh, can assure you, um, Judge Cradle's much, much too kind. Um, what inspired me? I think early on my family, uh, my mother would cut out pictures of every Portuguese lawyer, particularly one when we first moved to Connecticut. She would just subtly leave it on my nightstand. And, you know, pictures of this guy would come up all the time. And her message was, if he can do it, you can do it too. And I met him much later in my life, and he would say, did you have nightmares when your mother did that? Uh, he, he just passed away recently, uh, in fact. Um, so the people that inspired me were the people that I saw other minorities making it. They inspired me. Um, and I always tried to find someone that I wanted to um, model or be like. When I grow up, I want to be like you. Um, and those people inspired me. So I was lucky that I had a family uh, and a mother who was very pushy. Uh, and uh, uh, voluntarily or not inspired me. Um, and then now in my life now, I think I'm inspired by young people. I get no greater satisfaction than when I see a young person I mentor succeed, get a job, move up and do well. And I ask you, those of you starting out in your career, look for role models make connections. If you see somebody doing what you want to be doing, saying, hey, I really like what you do. How can I do that? Can you tell me? Ask them questions. Interrogate them, like our story. And how did you get there? I encourage you to do that. And then when you make it, you have to pay it forward. In Connecticut, as Judge Cradle mentioned, we have the Lawyers Collaborative for Diversity. We're both very active on it. We mentor. Uh, I try to, every step I can, help all young lawyers, not only lawyers of color, and I will. I'll mentor any young lawyer that, that wants advice um, because in reality, that feeds me, that helps me. And so I feel like I'm selfish because when they succeed, 
it just is the greatest, greatest feeling. And so when you do succeed, you have to pay it forward. It is not an option, it's an obligation. So when I see someone like Kia Woods, who life has thrown many challenges in front of her and she succeeds, those people inspire me. People like her, people that you know didn't have it so easy. And I didn't have it easy, I didn't, but I had a lot. Um, I didn't have parents who could help me financially or uh, they didn't know anything I was doing. They were just happy if I told them I was doing well. Um, they didn't quite understand any job I got. Oh, that's great, honey. You got an interview. That's wonderful. Yeah, you, you're happy? That's good. You happy? That's good. Um, but I knew they loved me and I knew they were there for me. So I had a great treasure in that way. But I think the way I try to inspire others is to um, help them, to try to get them to the best road they can be on to get to where they wanna be. I'm also very realistic. If somebody comes to me and says, I wanna be a US attorney, I'm saying, it's a great goal, but you gotta do this and this and this first. Um, and Kia's laughing, cause I will say to her, you know, okay, Kia, that's fine, but you're gonna have to do this and you're gonna have to do this because I don't believe in, in telling someone they can do something without first telling them what they need to do to get there, so. Thank you, and. for this panel, you guys are phenomenal. Like I am inspired um, to just go out and be the best version of myself. So I just wanna just to wrap this up, do you guys have any final charges to the crowd and to the lovely people here? And to the crowd, do you have any questions for these lovely panelists? Any questions? Well, I'm gonna encourage you guys to get their information. If you have any questions, just reach out to them because they are very personable and I spoke with all of them via email and they, they are really fast emailers. <laughs> <laughs> They're fabulous. Um, so they reach out to them, get their information, talk to them because they're amazing. No, albeit if you're a male or female, it doesn't matter. So reach out to them. And do you all have any final charges to the, to, um, the crowd? Any final words? Okay. No particular order. Well, let me, let me just, uh, thank you for allowing us to come here because thank you to Rashida and, and uh, Balsa and you know, the faculty here at Vermont Law School because I think it was a, it was a pleasure for us uh, to be able to come here and spend some time with you. So thank you very much and thank you. You're, you are pretty amazing, so. Thank you. I, I wanna also say thank you and I do wanna tell you that my clerk at the um, appellate court, oh, I, I was on the appellate court, uh, Judge Crater will say I did, For a, about two I did a, a drive through uh, for three months and I really only sat one term, but my clerk, uh, Alexis Peters is an alum from this school and she is just brilliant and amazing and I'm still working with her on one decision from the appellate court. But before I was nominated and moved to the Supreme Court, I had the pleasure of hiring the incoming term clerk for the appellate court next year and I hired another alum from Vermont Law and that's how much I think of your school, your faculty, your program. And I hired Anna McMonagall. I don't know if you remember her. She graduated a couple of years ago and she was a research law clerk in Bridgeport, a great young woman. And I hired her as my incoming term clerk. I called her on Monday and on Tuesday, the governor nominated me to the Supreme Court. <laughs> I did call her that morning and I said, you know, Anna, you know, there's a vacancy on the Supreme Court and, you know, my name's come up a couple of times, but I, 
I, I have no idea what's gonna happen, but if something should happen, you still have a job. <laughs> I don't want you to panic if you ever were ever to hear, knowing that the governor was gonna have a press conference the next day. Um, and I very much in touch with her, and she's gonna be terrific. And I know I spoke with one of you about going to do that kind of work, become a research clerk, uh, because we tend to hire our clerks from that pool. Um, and so um, I just think, I think your law school is fabulous. So uh, I look forward to it in the future. Uh, I do have to diversify, so I can't hire only Vermont law grads. But, but there's a special place in my heart for Vermont law. And so I encourage you to apply for clerkships. I do encourage you to apply for clerkships. They're really important. They'll expose you to uh, a variety of law and what you might like to do. They'll establish connections for you that will stay with you for life. So whether it's a federal clerkship, uh, circuit court, state courts, please, please keep those in mind. So I wanted to make sure that I got my words right, so I, I typed them down. I typed them out. Oh no! <laughs> there we go. Um, so my closest friends will tell you I am, I do not give folks advice that is unsolicited, and so I'm going to offer you something like a benediction or words of encouragement. Good work. Um, it's my love language, um, and so I'm also going to include myself in a bit of this. You know, accountability. My hope is that we never become so invested in power that we sacrifice human dignity. I hope we never so identify with our social privileges that we stop questioning how they're extensions of systems that decrease our collective quality of life. As future lawyers and folks with language for the law that might not go into law, um, my hope is that you'll see yourself in every, uh, in every, and your loved ones in every courtroom, every cell, every statistic. I hope you're still as set on fire to rebend the arc of the moral universe in 20 years as you are now, maybe even more so. Um, and just as a reminder, you've always existed at the intersection of your identity and your experiences. It is my fervent hope that you all maintain the courage to sit with the mess of your feelings, the inconsistencies of your worldview, and the most tender parts of your story, um, because it's important, the feelings are important. Your intellect and scathing cultural critiques will help engineer a different kind of society, but it's your sensitive heart and dedication to a higher standard for humanity that will help us all build a better one. Um, the next bit is a charge to women of color, like you asked, um, but especially black women. <laughs> uh, the world has benefited a great deal from our magic, usually at our expense. Sometimes the world marvels at it. They laud its ability to bring folks to the polls in Alabama, to bring people in the world, even as we struggle with some of the highest maternal death rates. Um, and so for us, I wish an added measure of hope, peace, and rest. Um, and once we all bounce back and we're well rested, I, um, I hope you all remember that it's not just important that the world gets your magic, but that it sees you conjuring. Um, it's going to give me a whole lot of hope to see you all conjuring. Um, and that's my sappy love note. a very short special presentation. Can I have Brantley Carter come up to the front, please? So when our e-board was sitting around a table and thinking about putting this program together, we thought about who we want to moderate this panel of wonderful women. And we thought our black men of BALSA should do that because it's not Although this program is called Black Girl Magic, I believe that our black men, it, they are here to uplift us and vice versa. So I want to highlight these three men, Brentley, Latif, and Ray, um, in a special way. And it's this, se this section of this program is called The Impact of Her Magic. So I'm gonna have three questions for these young men, and I just want them to answer candidly um, to you all, and just so you can get a glimpse and like who they are and why they are who they are. <laughs> awesome. So the first question is, what does black girl magic means to you? 
Brentley, you can go first. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, well, to me, I say black girl magic is one, being confident in who you are, being comfortable with who you are, while also defying the odds at the same time. Um, black girl magic to me means conjuring strength where the resources seem skint, making miracle happen when and where they need to happen. Uh, to me, black girl magic is uh, if you can't find a way, make one. And I'll uh, parlay with Ray with strength, definitely. There's a lot of strong women in here. Um, I have a lot of strong black women in my life and just the magic of what they provide, not only for themselves, but to those around them is, is magical, so. The next question is, what will you take from this program in particular? And just describe in a few words, or a sentence, that's fine. <laughs> Either one. So I will go with Ray first. <laughs> How does it feel to have some of this Medicine bag. <laughs> you know, exactly, Justice Khan. <laughs> I'm generally not one for a shortage of words. Um, I intend to take from this uh, panel, from this night, uh, to share the strength and uh, share in the well, share in the hope and the confidence that I have in black girl magic and the women of color in my life. Um, from tonight, I will definitely, just looking at the elegance and grace of these women that have uh, been gracing, gracing us with their presence, um, <laughs> just to go for with, just th don't stop, you know? It's a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, some of us are in it, some of us are at different points of it, but. You know, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, no matter what it is. Um, no matter what your drive is, no matter what your goal is, it's just all about getting there and don't stop and just keep progressing. And bring up those around you. I think uh, that was something else, too, um, to reach a hand behind you and get that next person and bring them along with you and don't be selfish or, you know, just keep going. <laughs> um, if anything, I think it serves as a, as a reminder for me to, one, be myself inside the classroom as well as outside, because my success is not strictly about me. It could possibly spark a light in somebody else to be their best and achieve their greater heights, and I believe that's how we grow as a culture and as one. Thank you. Last question. I'm gonna begin with Latif. Name someone in your life that embodies black girl magic, and tell us why you chose that person. Somebody that embodies black girl magic. Hmm. Um, there's several women. They are, are um, fortunately, I have a lot of strong black women in my life. I think uh, that common phrase, every, behind every strong black man is a strong black woman. And I'd actually like to point to my girlfriend over there. <laughs> um, raise your hand, Carol. Um, along with putting up with me, she's a very strong woman. She graduated from the number one HBCU in the country. Uh, she graduated, got a job. She got a promotion within the first year, and she embodies everything that I see within myself as a professional, and she helps me become a better man every day. Brentley? Oh, that's easy, definitely my mom. Um, yeah, without a doubt. And one being a single, a single parent raising two boys, I've seen her take several punches, not literally, but, you know, life has thrown her, I mean, yeah, well, you know, punches of life and, and adversity, and she just never gave up. She kept grinding and, and really instilled in me the, the, the attitude and spirit of perseverance and determination, so I wouldn't be here without her. For Connecticut, wow. yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I could talk about 
all of the trips to tutoring sessions mom brought me to, or all of the piano lessons that I received, or all the times I had to correct my handwriting because it just wasn't good enough for her. I could talk about how my sister inspires me every day. You know, as rough and as tumble as her experience is, that she still keeps finding it in her heart to lead with love. But I'm gonna talk about the women of color here at VLS who are constant, constant guiding light, uh, specifically in our own study group who keep us together, keep us on pace, keep us mission oriented. The women of Balsa who demonstrate to the rest of the campus community and to the Balsa community precisely how high we can get if we continue to rely on one another. I, I, I hate, I've always hated the expression crabs in a basket. Well, there's no crabs here. We're all here to lift one another up and put each other on that pedestal that shines and shows the rest of our community just how much we can do. Thank you so much, fellas. I really appreciate it. And I hope you all appreciate their responses because they were wonderful. Um, so I want to wrap up today's tonight's program. And I just want to say thank you to each and every person out there for staying so late. I know it's on a Friday, but it's really important for us to see so many faces out there because I want this conversation to continue as in any conversation. And just take what you learned today, tell your friends, tell your classmates, talk about these things, and uplift one another while we're here in VLS and even after we graduate. Because what I've learned so far, but being a 2L here, it's this hard, it's hard. It's a hard process to go to law school. We're in a small community and it seems like the world is so big, but here we are so small and tight. So just take each other, uplift one another, learn from one another, culture differences and backgrounds, and just give people hugs. I know, like, sometimes we just need hugs. So thank you, BALSA members. I really appreciate every single last one of you all, and I really appreciate my eboard because without you all, there would not be no me, and I really am humbly thankful. Bye. Thank you.